The third tranche of findings coming out of the state capture inquiry is divided into four volumes, each dealing exclusively with various aspects of Controversial Facilities Management Group, Basasa. In total, it's close to a thousand pages, making it impossible to digest into one explainer piece. The vast majority of the evidence you're about to hear comes from the former Chief Operations Officer of Basasa, Angelo Agrizzi. He spent more time on the stand at the inquiry than any other witness, a total of 13 days. Inquiry Chairperson Raymond Zonda ultimately found that Agrizzi's evidence is corroborated in various respects by the testimony of other witnesses, documentary and video proof. Angelo Agrizzi became a household name in South Africa, testifying on numerous occasions between mid-January 2019 and late June 2021. His open demeanor on the stand and forthright testimony about the grand scale of corruption Basasa was engaged in for close on two decades was not something South Africans are used to hearing. We all suspect it goes on, but here for the first time was a man explaining in intricate detail how millions upon millions in cash bribes had to be paid out painstakingly to a horde of government officials, ANC heavyweights and functionaries within entities of the state, all to make sure the tenders kept flowing Bosas's way. And flow they did. Zondo's report states that by Agritzi's estimation, the Bosasa group was awarded government tenders to the value of over 2.3 billion rand between 2000 and 2016. He also estimates that 75 million 700,000 rand was paid out in cash bribes over the same period. Zondo says Agritzi's calculations must be treated with a measure of caution. It could be overstated, it could be understated, but what isn't in dispute is that there was systemic corruption on what can only be described as an industrial scale. Bribes require cash, lots of it. Millions in inflated pricing were built into government tenders when they were awarded to Basasa, but the problem was getting those cutbacks to the people in the form of cash. Getting access to so much cash is actually a business on its own. You can hide monthly gratuities from your employer. You can hide it from the tax man. No one doing anything dodgy wants a digital footprint, but businesses have bank accounts. They have to declare their income, how much revenue is generated by a business, how much profit there is. When you deliver goods or services, you have to draw up invoices. The credits and the debits need to balance. Of course, there is always creative accounting, and these guys were pretty good at it. In this explainer, I'm going to focus on the methods Bosasa used to generate large volumes of cash. Who the bribes went to will be the focus of explainers to come. So subscribe to the Biz News channel and hit the bell to get notified every time we upload a new video. Bosasa would come to rely on the use of false invoices to a very large extent. Certain cash flush companies, some outside of the Bosasa group and some within, were used extensively as ATMs to fill up the eight walk-in vaults and numerous safes at Basasa's headquarters. In the beginning, cash would simply be drawn from Basasa's bank account through drawing up fake invoices for SMMEs that Basasa claimed didn't have bank accounts and had to be paid in cash. But the amounts of cash required for bribes exceeded what could logically be paid to an SMME, so they had to find another way around it. Invoices were also created for non-existent labor brokers. Shockingly, metropolitan funeral policy payouts were used as source documents for cash checks. Basasa would then advance the payment out of the Metropolitan Death Benefit Fund, but also generate an equivalent amount as a cash donation from the company to the family. That donation, of course, never made it to the family, but was used to pay bribes. With over 6,000 employees, Basasa quite often had staff pass away, so this was a very useful little trick for them. Fake invoices were generated for companies that had been liquidated. The report states that the fake invoices might take the form of the regeneration of a prior valid invoice for goods or services actually delivered. 
In one instance, an events company was added to the books to keep the auditors happy. False invoices for hired out equipment was paid for in cash checks, taken to the bank by Bosasa employees and the money then stacked in the vault. At one point, employees from Basasa's accounts department were leaving the bank with 700,000 rand in cash. The scheme also progressed to actual service providers generating false invoices served on Basasa. The report finds Basasa paid the service providers who then repaid Basasa in cash and deducted a percentage for their own account with the cash being delivered directly to Mr. Watson. Basasa went on to buy a share in Belfast Toyota as it had a fuel station and a kiosk that generated significant amounts of cash. Basasa also outright bought the company that owned the fuel station. Fake invoices for fuel would be created. Basasa would then pay for the fuel via EFT and the equivalent amount in cash would then be transported to Basasa's headquarters daily. Fake shell companies were even started by Bosasa simply to generate invoices against which cash checks could uh, justifiably be put through the system. After a while, Watson would then just liquidate these fake companies. Agritzi also testified that a man called Rian Huxma of Rikele Construction was the middleman who facilitated that a company called Jumbo Liquor Wholesalers invoice Bosasa for large quantities of booze. The liquor wholesalers were cash flush and could meet Basasa's demands. So they would be paid via EFT for fake invoices and then provide the equivalent in cash back to Basasa. Huxma would receive anything between 5 and 7.5% commission for arranging this cash for Basasa. These invoices would then be written off by Basasa as tax deductible expenses. Another company, AA Wholesalers, were similarly used as a cash cow, generating fake invoices amongst some real ones though, and being paid by EFT to then return that amount of cash minus their cut. The difference here was that AA Wholesalers were sometimes invoicing for legitimate goods, but would charge massively inflated prices. Basasa paid via EFT once again and the difference between the actual price and the overstated price on the invoice would then be delivered back to Basasa in cash. What's interesting about this next company, Equal Trade 4 and Equal Food Traders, is that there is actual documentary and photographic evidence attached to the affidavit of one Greg Lawrence. He delivered millions in cash for fake invoices to Basasa under instruction from his business partner, Greg Lake and Allen, who told him they could avoid having to pay bank charges on massive cash deposits by rather providing the cash to Basasa and being paid via EFT with their 1.5% commission on every invoice. Lake and Allen and Basasa employees used the code word CHICKEN in WhatsApp messages as a means of discussing how much cash was needed for a drop. One ton of chicken equaled one million rand. Eventually, Lauren started recording his cash drops as he suspected the arrangement was wrong and he wanted to protect himself. As these documents show, the invoices were drawn up for non-vatable food items like rice, sunflower oil, beans, samp and millimeal. The invoices were for food, destined for 33 different correctional facilities Basasa had contracts with to run the canteens. Agritzi would famously point out that we don't serve rice in prison, illustrating the absurdity of even invoicing for the food item. One of the facilities managed by Basasa, the Lindela Repatriation Center in Krugersdorp, was yet another means by which to elicit cash. Basasa ran the canteen and phone services at the center. Both food and telephone services had to be paid for in cash by foreigners awaiting repatriation. Up to 15% of the cash sales at Lindela were actually declared as revenue, while the rest was transferred to Basasa's vaults. The scheme could generate up to 400,000 rand a month for Basasa. Basasa owned several bars and canteens at mining hostels and the same modus operandi of underreporting revenue and transporting the rest in cash to the head office went on. 
Wasasa even had its own special cash and transit team that did the dirty work. Wasasa had various construction sites where work was being done. So using fake payroll documents generated on Excel spreadsheets, they paid workers wages via cash checks. Wasasa staff then went to cash those checks at the banks. On one occasion, they walked out with 720,000 Rand in cash. This practice took place weekly. This little scheme, however, came to an end when the Unemployment Insurance Fund, the UIF, started requiring that employers pay UIF even for casual labor. So that ended that. All this money would go into the eight walk-in vaults and numerous safes at Basas's head office with Agritzi saying the minimum housed in a single vault at any given time was at least two million rand and six and a half million rand was the maximum except for Christmas time because, well, you know. At their peak, up to 3 million rand in cash was being delivered to Basasa weekly. Who were all the bribes going to? More on that in part two. I'm Mike Lebel. Thanks for watching.